city will be fine Blowing up like dynamite, I never meant to make you cry Make your mind up Hi and welcome to This Is Ibrox, my name is Tommy McIntyre in the chair for once so much like a centre forward has to play at the back, I am completely out of my comfort zone <laughs> although thankfully I'm joined by three stalwarts to help me keep a clean sheet this evening I am joined by a regular compatriot William Boyd, William how are you doing? I'm fine Tommy, how, how are you doing yourself? I'm the host, I don't matter um, I'm also joined by... <laughs> River City's Stephen Pulden. Stephen, how are you getting on? <clears throat> not bad, mate, not bad. Good to be back to see you guys. I won't ask how you are because you're in the chair, mate, so just... You know, Thank you. Know. Just be well warned that when we come to speak about the Aberdeen game, I will be asking you under oath if you've actually seen it live or whether you saw it <laughs> on the clips at a later point in time. Uh, it was a one-off. Yeah, and then I'm also joined by a very, very special guest and I, I thought about how best to introduce them. Did I talk about the Cup Winners Cup? Did I talk about that goal at 16? Did I talk about the silverware that uh, he's got in the trophy hall? Or do I talk about those fantastic pictures and uh, his turn of leg wearing the kilt in the new MyGels promotional pictures? It is the one and only <laughs> DJ Derek Johnson. Derek, how are you? I'm fine. Lovely to see you gentlemen. Let's have a good night anyway. That's what it's all about. We're all about the Rangers. Exactly, mate. There we go. That's a perfect way to start. We will come back to those pictures and that kilt, by the way, uh, DJ, at some point. <laughs> in way, it's, it's not something I've worn a lot. I think once before I've worn the kilt. When I was asked to do it, I went, well, why not? And honestly, it felt really, really good. And I, I would feel, I mean, if I was going to have a, a wedding or whatever, I certainly would wear it now. Yes. Because, it, because it's, it's made solely for me. It just fitted really well. And it was great, a wee, a wee bit of fresh air going up the legs and everything, it was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quickly checking the watershed there to see where that was going, uh, DJ. <laughs> I'd also point out as well that uh, I take it, DJ, just by looking at you on the screen there a moment ago when I was doing the introductions, you got my point about a centre-forward playing at the back as well being a, a multi-talented player that you were. So, gentlemen, I'll, I'll start at the beginning. And, Jake, I'll, I'll start with your, your good self. Rangers v Aberdeen at the weekend and the words comprehensive and a complete victory etc have been used, a really good 4-0 victory, probably going on a bit more. I was wondering what your takes were. Having well, you know what, you know, any time Rangers play Aberdeen and it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how Rangers are playing or it doesn't matter how Aberdeen are playing, there's a war between these two clubs, you know, the supporters especially. So we all, we all know what it's about, you know, you have to battle against an Aberdeen side and I was I was fed up reading and listening before the game or a couple of days before the game they're without all these players but it doesn't matter the players that they played you know have all played this season it wasn't as if it was 15 and 16 year olds that played they know exactly what playing against Rangers is all about it's all about getting men behind the ball it's all about defending it's all about tackling you know trying to put us off our game but we went out there with a great mentality you know and, and, and that will to win which we've got so far this season, so far. And I think from the first minute we were out there, and, you know, after two or three minutes, I said to myself, listen, we're really up for this today. We're going to have to be to beat this Aberdeen side. And I thought, yeah, there were wee times in the game where there was a couple of wee lulls, but you can never get a team playing for 90 minutes great all the time. But I thought for what we did, with something like 79% of the ball, they weren't interested in coming forward. A couple of times they did come forward. A wee bit more in the second half when they had to, because they were two or three down at the time. But I thought it was a good, complete performance. We made five substitutions, but the team wasn't weakened. And that's the huge difference with this team this year. If you look at the squad we've got, <clears throat> we've got at least two players for every position. So we're very, very strong. And it's a case for the manager saying, well, look, here's the 11 I'm picking. If you play well, it'll be the same next week. If not... I've got people waiting in the wings, desperate to play. And I think that players will remember that if you're in the side, you'll want to stay there. Because you, if, if you don't play well, you might find yourself out for two or three games. Yeah. You know, so, and I think they've got that into their head. Eventually, after a couple of years, I think it's settling into players what our club really means. And I think they're all desperate you know, to do something for the manager. Because the manager has worked mm. hard. He's changed this club unbelievably in three years time. No, we haven't won a trophy. We need to get back to that. We all accept that. But we'll yeah. have a chance this year, a real chance. But that's all it is. As long as we keep doing what we're doing, I've got a right good feeling about this season. 
So Stephen, De- Denny agrees a, a very good a good point there in terms of the squad depth and being able to turn to the bench. Is that something that you've noticed as well, that the fact that this team continues to be able to provide and play a certain style away with no drop-off when other players are coming in? Yep, 100%. It's like, it's been said a few times in the press and you hear like a lot of the pundits saying it as well. And it is, it's like, it's not just... We've not just got a squad where we're bringing a player on for the sake of it. It's quality for quality. It's like the beautiful thing at the weekend for me was taking Ryan Jack off and then you're bringing on... You're taking Ryan Jack off. You're bringing on like Glenn Kamara, Steve Davis. You're taking Morelos off. You're bringing Defoe on. You're bringing Itton on. You're bringing Hadji. It's quality players, international players that we're bringing on. And the shape isn't changing. The team are still... I mean, you've seen it in the 90th minute. Arfield and Defoe, 91st minute, are still trying to pepper the goal. We're still... We're still going for more goals. The team, in my opinion, for the first time under Gerard, they look absolutely possessed. They just look so determined to go out there, like Derek says, and just do it for the manager. And we look like a team at Disney Mart. I mean, in the past, when results have went away the previous day, Rangers have maybe went out and maybe stuttered over the line or have maybe no quite took advantage of other results. But no, it's just it's just a case of going out. And it, doesn't, it looks like anybody we're playing in the league, especially, we're just going out and we're... We're getting the job done. We're so, so efficient. It all started, Stephen, when I went there as a kid <clears throat> under Jock Wallace. Jock Wallace said to me, listen, if you want to finish second or third in the league or you're struggling for relegation or you want to be in the middle of the league, then don't bother coming here. This is yeah. a club you're here to win trophies. You know, we won yeah. more trophies than any other club in the world. You mm-hmm. know, and, that, and that's yeah. something to be proud of. Yeah, so I of think that's, yeah. that's, what you, that's what you've got to get into players' heads. Because, I mean, it's an old saying, and you lads will know it as well, every game for Rangers is a cup final because everybody wants to beat you. And if you yeah. don't if you don't win your battle, then you're not going to win the war. Jock always exactly. said that whoever you're playing against, you make sure you dictate to him. If you do that, and there's seven or eight of your own players doing that to them, then you're going to win the game. Yeah, but it's all about getting the winning mentality. Stephen's got it because yeah. he was at Liverpool, three European Cups, you know, things like that. You need to have yeah. that inside you. And that's what players need to get when you walk into that front door. And it's hard to argue um, that every game's a cup final when it's said by a man who's won cup final <laughs> as, as well. <laughs> so, exactly. Um, William, just, just talking to you for a second there, because the guys were laying out, not only there was a complete performance against Aberdeen, certainly in my recent understanding, I think that's probably the best and easiest we've, we've handled Aberdeen for a long time. <laughs> but a lot was made of, and a lot is made of our squad and our clean sheet record. But I feel that just over the, the recent last couple of weeks, the forward line is really grabbing teams by the scruff of the neck. And I know a lot was made of Kmar Roof's movement for that second goal as well, spinning in behind. Who's really impressing you up top at the moment? I think they're all kind of, you know, playing their part. They're, they're definitely all catching my eye. At the beginning, you know, while Roof was trying to maybe um, kind of get up to match sharpness, I kind of thought it was was going to take a wee bit longer, but he's came back and, I mean, that game against Aberdeen, I think that's the best he's played. He looked really sharp. That was seen in his goal, as you've touched on. You know, he's quick feet in the box. A lovely, sweet touch to kind of get him in. And, you know, we got a wee bit fortunate with the goal, but, um, you know, I, I, think, I think Roof's maybe kind of catching my eye a wee bit more than maybe, you know, uh, Kent. Kent did at the start of the season, but they're all having their, their kind of periods and kind of, you know, certain weeks. They're all kind of coming in and uh, kind of in and out, sort of catching eyes, probably more shining through than, than others. But uh, I do, I, I really like uh, Morelos. He's kind of new role in the team as well, kind of coming deep and kind of dragging defenders because it was kind of seen a few times where Considine was kind of getting dragged out and kind of brought out into kind of uncomfortable positions, I kind of felt. And that's allowing our midfield as well to get a lot more goals. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's taking a wee bit of stick, William. Ellis because he's not scoring goals. Yeah. But you've got to look at his all-round game now. You know, he's certainly working a lot harder than, than he did before. And yeah. we, we used to, we and Rangers fans used to say, if Morales doesn't score, then Rangers are struggled. Yeah. Not anymore. Yeah. Because we've got so many men in that team that are scoring goals. We've got a right back that scored 12 goals. I, know, and I don't crazy. care if nine of them are penalty kicks. You've still to score them. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the biggest thing I've noticed about the team this year, you know, all around, they're, they're playing really well. But you watch when we lose the ball. See how quickly we we'll close them down to get it back. Now, that's a thing that Barcelona do well, Real Madrid, Liverpool. Obviously, mm-hmm. that's where Steven gets it. As soon as you lose it, you get in at them and get that ball back. 
And I think we're doing that really, really well. Derek, just another question on that then. As, a, as an ex-player, uh, and then I'll open this up to the, to the guys as well, have you been impressed by, and there's been a lot of talk about this as well, you're a player that's played in a couple of different positions, obviously well-known as being up top, but you've had to do your auxiliary stuff as well. Rangers' rotation in-game of players tracking the ball or filling spaces, etc., is that a noticeable difference uh, or a, an iteration from what Stephen's been trying to get into the team? Because it seems as though other opponents are just bamboozled by the movement. Well, you know, you know the problem is, and you're right, I, I think the movement is really, really good. If you're the opposition and somebody's told to mark Arfield, for instance, you mark him. So all of a sudden, Arfield's playing it in the centre and all of a sudden, he's out in the left wing and out in the right wing. Does that player get dragged out the middle to go and pick him up? You know, so you're making people think about things. Even Morelos, you're a centre half, I'm going to look after him. And he goes, he comes back in his own half and gets about, do I go with him or do I stay here? You're making opposition players think about what you're doing. And when Morelos is coming back, somebody from midfield's going forward. They've got the space. So I think it's a great thing to have that. And, and I noticed that with the three midfielders. I mean, you'll see them changing all the time. Wherever the ball is, there'll be a player there, and whoever was there before will move inside. Mm. And I think it's, they obviously work very, very hard in training on that. Mm. But it's a hard thing to do. My worry at times is uh, McGregor kicks two long balls in a whole game because obviously he wants to play out from the back. And yeah, that's great because you've got possession. If you, you've got the ball, you've got possession. But there was a couple of times on Sunday where uh, Bellingham got it and you actually had to beat the player inside the box because the player got that close to him. We'll need mm -hmm. to watch that. We're going to get caught out now and again. We're going to get caught out doing that. And I think it's just confidence of players when you get the ball, being able to calm yourself down and pass it. 99 times of 100, we do it really well and we get ourselves mm -hmm. down the park. But just now and again, the concentration level with the centre-backs has got to be a wee bit better. Stephen, just, just yeah. picking up on, on what DJ is saying there in terms of the concentration and the, the focus that Rangers have brought to their performances. And, and I'm, I was going to touch on later about the, the, the progress the team has made under Stephen Gerrard, and particularly this season. I'll bring that forward because you guys are well ahead of me in terms of the conversation. So I'm not going to catch up from the host chair here. But it's probably an easy phrase, but does this Rangers team, and, and DJ was right earlier on, you know, we, we've seen this in previous seasons, we've had a really good start to the season and then it's maybe the wheels have come off. Does this feel like a different type of beast to you? And if it does, why? I think it, do it does, but like DJ was saying at the start, you don't want to get carried away. We've been here before, we've all been here before, but there definitely seems something different. For a start, I can't remember, probably since Walter Smith left, I can't remember being this far ahead of Celtic. So that's a big thing to begin with. We're, I mean, I know it's only, they win their games in hand, it's done 85, but we've got the points on the board, we're having ahead. So that's different in itself. The way we're handling the pressure, I think, any time Celtic have slipped up is different. We look like it's not really affecting us, we're just going out, going about our game. But just the intensity and the fl how, how fluid the team are, like when they've got the ball, when they've no got, especially when they've not got the ball yesterday, are like, for example, in the centre half, have got the ball. Barisic and Tav are taking players into the areas they don't want to go. You know what I mean? Like, for example, Hedges yesterday, who I think is a really good player. He looks a decent player for Aberdeen. He's. Needs to lose the headband. Needs to lose the, head. eh? Needs to lose the headband. <laughs> it does, actually. It does. But he's trying to track. He's trying to stay with Barisic. But Barisic is effectively gone like a, a left yeah. striker. He's going to way up and Hedges is way back. That kind of stuff doesn't just happen overnight. I think. Gerard came to Rangers with a vision and a plan, and I think now we're seeing it come into fruition. It's been a project for him for like, this is the third year, and now I can see, I'm sure he can sit there and him and Michael Beale are looking at it going, this is the way we want our team playing. Do you know what I mean? This is what yeah. we're doing. But there is definitely something different, but I'm just so, I just don't want to get ahead of myself. At the end of the day, Celtic won two games, it's 25 points. January for me, we play Celtic at home, Aberdeen away, Motherwell away. Ross County home, Hibs away. Come the end of January, I think you'll fully see where the team is at. January but do you, do you, know, do you know the secret though? People often say, oh well, Celtic have got them this week and we were, never mind what Celtic are doing. Aye, we exactly. have to look after ourselves. Exactly. You know, Aye, we, we exactly. can't do anything to, to work towards Celtic. We can yeah. only do what we're doing ourselves. We keep winning all our games, we've won the league. 
that should yeah, be the mentality. Exactly. Yes, you say exactly. we're eleven ahead. Even if you're better having the points in the bag, you're mm-hmm. right. They've got yep. two games in hand. Used to say they're going to win the two games in hand. Exactly, I know. But, exactly. But we'll take that for granted. So we're five points ahead, and that's the way you look at it. Mm-hmm. You just look after ourselves. If we do the business, there's nothing they can do to us, and vice versa. Exactly. So exactly. That's the main, and the other great thing that I'm loving about the manager, and this comes from Liverpool as well, they were never allowed by the, the, the people in charge at Liverpool to talk about league titles a third or a quarter away through the season, even though they were up front. Mm-hmm. They don't even talk about that. Yeah. Anytime Stephen was asked it, listen, long way to go. Even Roof, right. after the game as well, was in Yeah, the exactly. And yeah. We've taken nothing for granted. I think they've been told, and rightly so, too many of them mm-hmm. in January were coming out with, yeah, we've got a great chance. And we're Never mind all that. Just, right. just take each game, win the game, and be happy about it. Let the yep. press talk about that. Let the media, because they'll do that anyway. But let's yep. keep our feet on the ground and just do what we're doing and we'll be fine. A hundred percent. Yeah. Just a, again, uh, DJ and Stephen raising really, really good points there in terms of the mentality of, of the team. And honestly, guys, it looks as though you're peering over my shoulder at my notes because you are destroying what I have put together as a... <laughs> I'll do my best to cycle around. Oh, I see <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm too wee, I can't see. I can't see him. <laughs> you're, on, you're on the same <laughs> platform, Stephen, don't you worry about it. Um, I'm just wondering there, William, DJ and Stephen were talking about it. Now, this Rangers team, it's what's well, version 3.0 for, for Stephen Gerrard. He's been in, he's been backed by the board, and we'll, we'll touch on some of those figures in a moment from the accounts that were, were put out on Friday as well. He's got, I think, arguably you know, the strongest squad that... Uh, that I've seen in a Rangers jersey for a long, long time. He's been seriously backed. Performances are there. Do you think, whilst keeping our feet firmly on the ground and putting the cones out and all that round about it, do you think this is what Gerard and his team have been working to, that this is their best chance to look at a serious tilt at the title, even post-Christmas? Absolutely. I think, you know, he's he's been kind of adding the quality players in, you know, over these kind of three seasons over the transfer windows, and I do, I think it's the strongest squad we've had. I mean, even if we lose maybe two, three, four players, we've still got players that can come in. You've seen it with the rotations recently. I think it was two or three games back to back we were um, rotating five, five in, five out constantly, you know, and sometimes we were doing that, maybe you'd be a bit worried if we were doing that and you kind of start panicking, but but recently it's, it's you look at the team and you can't really tell what one's going to be our strongest side, you know, when some of the players are coming in. Um, but I do, I think he's kind of built up for it. And I think, you know, if we maybe go out in January and strengthen again, which might be possible, um, you know, it could kick us on further, you know, and, and, and really kind of keep up the pressure. Well, uh, we'll keep kind of racking up the points. Well, well, let me broaden that question out to all three of you then to maybe have a have a think and come back to me. If Rangers were to go out in January, let's say, looking for a player or two, where do you think this team could do with a little bit more strengthening? Or do we think we're set... I think I think we've got the squad. Yeah, if it was Lionel Messi or Ronaldo, then yes, of course you would. But I think with what we've got, I don't think he needs anybody else. And what he needs to do, possibly, is try and offload two or three in January. The ones, sadly, that are not involved in the squad at all. You know, mm. he might have to do it that way. And he'll save some money that way. But I don't think he's desperate. I mean, does he need a goalkeeper? No. Does he need a fullback? We've got the... 13 goals or whatever is captain at right back. And you've got Patterson, who is a great player as well, who can fill yeah. in any time. You've got big Shirley Bassey at the left back. <laughs> he looks like great player. Right? He looks like great We've got, we've got eight yes. midfielders, we've got three wide men, and we've got five strikers. I mean, we don't need anybody else. I think we're strong with what we have. And mm. if, if we can keep everybody fit and away from this COVID and everything else, then I think we're fine. I think I think we're not looking at that. I know you, you you're on about the the, the fifteen point nine million that they were behind, you know. But again, like Celtic, you know, if if they're needing money, they'll sell somebody. And and even if we did sell Morelos, and I'm not saying we're going to sell him, and we'll get eight, nine, ten million. There's ten million. We've already got six or seven million pounds for the UEFA, and we're still not finished with that yet. Exactly. So that'll look after that that money. That the money that Stephen has spent has been well spent, and we'll get that back this season. So I, th- I think all in all, and that's what he's done. Because remember, in two thousand and twelve, when when we 
I was going to say, when we get forced down to the bottom division, we went down. Ali, five days before, the first game against Brecon City in the Cup, had five players. That was all he had on the books. So you think coming back from there to now, you know, we'll fit the struggle all the way through these leagues and everything else. We never had the money, the money to bring the best players in because they never wanted to play in these leagues. So it's taken us an awful long time you know, to get back. And eventually, I think now, I think we're back to where we should be. But the only way I can say that 100% is by winning things. Yes. We should have won the League Cup last season. We know that. We absolutely pummeled Celtic. Missed a penalty. They get a goal that should have been a free kick. Battered them. But we still get beat. We are built on winning trophies. And Stephen knows that. And I think now he's got the best squad. Like William said, I think that's the best squad we've had. And I think about 15 years. So we've got a great chance if everybody keeps doing the job and they screw the head. Yep. Yeah. I think the, uh, to paraphrase other people's supports, uh, I think they can definitely see us coming now. Um, <laughs> so I just taking that then and leaping on, because we've spoken about the squad. And, and William, I'll start with you before I move on to Stephen here. Rangers released their uh, annual accounts on Friday. Um, uh, and I very kindly followed that up with a, an interview with the Price of Football's Keenan Maguire, which you can find on the This Is I Brooks uh, website and YouTube channel. That's called a plug. I'm quite happy with that. I'll swiftly roll over that. <laughs> um, so I, obviously the the headline figure with any pro, you know profit loss or accounts from any football club, particularly Rangers, because it seems to be a fascination for, for Scotland when Rangers produce their accounts, is that there's a... <laughs> A loss in there, so it was circa 15, uh, 15 million for Rangers. But the underlying figures were quite positive. W- what did you take away from having looked at them? Yeah, no, I've, you, you, obviously it sticks out that you've made what was it, a sixteen million pounds loss or roundabout then, and you kind of, you know, it, to me, I, I think if we were in any sort of trouble, the directors would have took the money that we were offering in the summer for Morelos, you know, to cover <laughs> this. Um, but I think you know that the, they see a vision. I think the directors have said any kind of shortfalls in the income that they're going to step up and, and see as good like they have since they've came in, basically for day one. And I, I think, you know, something else that's kind of vital to, to maybe our season, I think it was Derek that, uh, DJ that uh, touched on it, was Europa League, you know, the progression to the next round of the Europa League is going to bank us a lot of money if we keep that up and it will hopefully boost the fiddles for next year. Because I think in your, your interview, you know, Kieran had said about how he expects um, some of the income to dip. So, uh, for next season, I don't know if that'll be the case. I don't know with the, the numerous sponsors that uh, James Bisgrove has been kind of signing us oh, up to. I've got an no, incredible right. amount. So, so I think maybe uh, hopefully we'll make a good bit of money. But you know, it's going to be hard in this kind of uh, situation. But if we go on, you know, it's odd to do with player uh, trading sales and that as well. So yeah. if we get that right, maybe hopefully avoid selling anybody in January and maybe in the summer when we've hopefully won something. Um, we can maybe sell a player and operate, you know, ourselves, basically. Yeah. yeah. Even no, I, th- I think you, you brought a name into there, which is absolutely correct. Sorry, Tommy. No, 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 not at all. But James, but James Bisgrove has done a fantastic job. Yeah. When you see all the sponsorship that he's brought in, <clears throat> and even getting the Rangers shops back, the one at Ibrooks especially, you know, the, the amount That's priceless, sold, man. That's sold, priceless. Sold something like 90,000 ships and everything. I mean, our fans are desperate to buy the Rangers stuff. I mean, that's all yeah. money that's all going to come into the club. You know, we're now building another super dome behind the, the Copeland Road end for supporters yeah. and everything else, a museum and everything else. Everything about the club, if, you, if you've walked around there just now, it's unbelievable the work that they've done. Yeah. I mean, I did a little video for the club about the dressing rooms and everything else. The place is just looking a million dollars. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think the money side of it is coming in, and James has a lot to do with that. He's bringing a hell of a money in. Yeah. And to be fair to the fans as well, they've, already, they've sold over 40,000 season tickets and they're exactly. not even allowed to go and see the games. <laughs> you know, so so that's, that, that's, that's what the Rangers fans are all about. They, they play a big part in this as well. But yeah, yeah. But, but the press are great. We lost 15.9 million. Celtic were worse than us. They lost more money than we did. No, no. You yeah, know, yeah. So it's one of these things. Money, money and Rangers always seem to go together with, with the media. And it is a lot of money, but... It's not as bad as people are making it out to be, that's for sure. I think that's a really good point there. And, and DJ and William have both referenced the, the 15.9 million loss, but you've got you know, a, a revenue increase of 11%. Um, you've got those deals that 
James Bisgrove and the, the rest of the commercial department are, are keenly working on and adding to the stable as well. You've also got the partnerships with different clubs, Bengaluru FC, Orange County. We've also got, and Stephen, this is to you directly, we've got a growing number of really good high-tier investors. So we've got Julian Woolhart, who's um, out in the Far East with BCP, Dion Capital. And then we've got Stuart Gibson, who recently came on uh, from ESR as well. Does it look as though Rangers now really built a strong, I'm going to say squad, right, because that's the best way for me to say it, a squad of investors of a high calibre who not only have said we're interested now, but they're interested in an ongoing basis to plough in the £9 million for the rest of this season, the £15 million for next season as well. Should people be really comfortable and, uh, and confident when you see that type of investor coming up? I would say so, definitely. I mean, like DJ was saying, like when you, I took my wee boy a walk over to Ibrox a month or so ago and just a walk about, just seeing it, me and my son, and you're looking at the place and it's night and day compared to going to watch Rangers when we're in SFL 2. Do you know what I mean? When we're in the second division and third division and you're like, now we actually look investment-wise, like if we were in trouble, like the press would lead you to believe you would have sold Morelos when Morelos was getting a chance to go. But then you look at the Edmiston House development that's getting done, the museum that DJ is talking about. I think the biggest thing we've got to know, in the background, we've got major investors that are there, that look like they're there for the big time, they're there for the long time. But on the field, you need to remember you've got the Euros coming up. You're going to have Glenn Kamara on show. You're going to have Borna Barisic on show. You've got all these players that we can make money off. Morelos, obviously not going to bet the Euros, but Morelos, but you're still going to maybe make money. I think, they look in such a financially secure place at the moment, I would say. But nobody's in a great place now with the global pandemic, but Rangers are in safe hands, I think, at the moment. Yeah, it's certainly a feel good a feel good factor around the club, and I, I think the governance of it is, is definitely there. William's obviously uh, done a runner as soon as you <laughs> sort of investor. Yeah, you mentioned investors, he thought he was gonna to have to put his hand in his pocket. He's done a run-up. <laughs> as simple as that. Trust me, I know, I know what he's like. He might, he might come back to us. So, oh, I, he's in my house here. <laughs> <laughs> he's held you behind that. the tree. <laughs> he's, in, he's into my gin. <laughs> <laughs> well, no chance of getting him back at the house then, to be honest with you. That <laughs> the podcast. But I, I'm interested then. So we've got you know really good news stories uh, coming up. Um, we've got really good performances on the pitch. And we're all looking forward to success. But it's also probably really important that we don't forget where we've come from and some of the other really important things that, that the Rangers have cycled through as a club. And, and Derek, I'm going to uh, turn to you immediately. Um, I keep switching between Derek and DJ. I'm going to have to get a handle on that, definitely. Um, <laughs> you call me big man. <laughs> <laughs> the in the post, DJ. <laughs> um, but I'm, you know, it's a, moving on to a, a serious topic. You know, on the 2nd of January uh, coming up, it's going to be the 50th anniversary of the, of the Ibrox disaster. You know, and no football fan should should go to a game and, and not be able to return home. And I know having we had Natalie Nairn and um, Greg Marshall on from the club uh, on this Ibrox just recently talking about the steps that they're taking to try and make sure that the anniversary celebration commemorations are probably the better way of saying that are in place. I'm just wondering for you, DJ, as someone who's played for the club, who understands the community aspect of it, what this what this anniversary means? Well, it's a sad anniversary, obviously. I mean, I played in the game. Uh, I'll never forget it. I mean, everything about that day is in my head. I mean, don't tell me what I was doing yesterday, but 50 years ago, it's all in there. Of course, the players didn't know anything had happened. As soon as the game finished, we were off up the tunnel and in the dressing room. So we, we don't know what's happening. There's no television. There's no sky that, that's there and, and telling you everything that's going on. You know, I, I've gone in the bath and, and the likes of John Gregg and Sandy Jardin and Willie Mathis and people like that, they always had a quick shower or a quick bath and they were on their way back to Edinburgh and Fife. They've gone, they've gone in their cars and gone home and don't, didn't know anything about it. It was one of these things. I was one of these players that loved to lie in the bath after the game, you know, and just relax and everything else. I can always remember coming out in the, the bath and in the dressing room, and there was maybe only a couple of the lads, and they were almost dressed. And the door came open, and uh, there was these ambulance men come in. 
and they've, they've put these packages all on the floor. And I said, what's going on? And it was only then he explained what had happened. And sadly, these people that died were right in front of me. They had, they had them out on the pitch at the corner flag. They were all lined up, but they decided to bring them inside. You know, it, it's the quickest I ever got dressed in my life. It was just so sad. I couldn't believe. Remember, I'm only 17, 18 years of age when this all happened. And it was such a try. And as the night went on, you know, the television get more and more involved and we were hearing about, I mean, at that time, we didn't know there were, there were 66 unfortunate Rangers fans that, that they were dead. You know, the, the, we only thought there was these half a dozen that were there. That, that was it. You know, and it's only as, as the night went on and, and the figures went up and up and up, you realised how massive it was. I mean, it would be massive if there was only one. But for so many, it was, it, it was incredible. And for, for days, I mean, we, we never went back to Ibrox for two, three weeks. The manager didn't want anybody near the place. And, uh, and I think that was the hardest three weeks of my life because all the players in the club plus the management and the backroom staff, went to the funerals of these, these 66. Every one of them had a Rangers player or the manager there at it. I think in the end, I went to, I went to about 17 or 18 funerals in the, in the space of that two weeks. You know, and it's, and it, and it's something, it's, that, these sort of things stick in your mind, and it still does to this day. And the 15th, at 50th anniversary, it won't be special because there's nothing special about that. It's just a number. That's how many years ago it was. But certainly it'll be a, ba a sad, sad day, you know, when that comes around. And uh, I think all the players, I mean, I was, I was probably the, the youngest player in that side. But everybody will be suffering. Everybody will be suffering. All the players were there. And all the Rangers fans as well, because the older ones especially that were around at that time, and maybe some of them were at the game as well. I mean, it's just something you never, ever, ever want to see again. Yeah, and sadly, you know, Hillsborough came up and all that. So, I mean, that brought back memories again. But I hope Rangers do something very, very special for it, for them and for the families of, of the, the people that died as well. It'd be great to have everybody have a big service inside Ibrox, you know, and, and invite all these families along. I think that would be the best thing for everybody to do. Get all the whole Rangers family together and... and, and, and uh, and just do what the, the minister do what he has to do. I mean, Stephen, it's I was aware that uh, the DJ had played in the game. It's it's powerful stuff hearing you speak about it, uh, DJ, and I yes. pre appreciate that. Um, I, I think DJ's right as well. You know, the club have said they are going to try and do as best they, they can in the current circumstance of having social distancing, etc. I, I suppose me and you, Stephen, being supporters of the club as well, never having you know managed to pull on the jersey or anything like that. How important is it for you as, a, as part of the fan base to see the club make sure that they remember what is an absolute tragic circumstance, but what is woven into the fabric of the club? Ah, it's, it's vital. I mean, obviously, like DJ speaking earlier, right, it was so powerful actually hearing somebody speaking about it who was there eh, firsthand. But I totally, the club, I'm, and I'm sure they will they'll do something and they always do, like DJ mentions the Rangers family, it is, it's like... I'm only 37, obviously I wasn't alive when it happened, but it's part of my Rangers history. Like my dad kind of drummed into me, this is what happened, he explained it to me. And when that date comes along, it's always a kind of haunting feeling, even though I wasn't alive when it happened. But I think it is important for the club to do it, because it it's, you need to, you need to honour your history, whether we want to remember it or not. You need, it's a terrible thing that happened, but it's still part of your history. And you need to, you need to pull together in the times and, it's just, I can't quite comprehend. Actually, hearing DJ speak about it, there's quite, it's a wee bit chilling, do you know what I mean, actually hearing it. But the club always, they always do well by certain events that have happened in the past, and I'm sure they will again. Yeah, uh, I, I echo, I echo that, that sentiment. You know, 66 supporters, never, ever to be forgotten. And I should see if anyone listening has a, or knows someone who has a, a personal connection uh, with the anniversary and want to be part of the club's planning and preparations, please uh, email alwaysremembered at rangers.co.uk or if you can't use that and that email is alwaysremembered at rangers.co.uk, you can phone 0141 580 8670 and that'll take you straight through the club and we'll make sure that all that information is on the link for this podcast as well. 
moving on uh, from from that, let's maybe look ahead. Uh, and I think Stephen, actually, you you showed your your research earlier, which I very much appreciated because you rhymed off the upcoming fixtures. So I'll I'll start with I'll start with you as well. Rangers have got themselves into a really good position. We've touched on that at length here. We also know that November, December becomes a really truncated part of the season where things can accelerate or decelerate really, really quickly depending on how you get through it. Looking ahead, we've also got the Europa League games and you know, Benfica with all the COVID out players coming over the hill as well. Great to see Nunez is not going to be in that, that, that team. Mm-hmm. What stands out for you in terms of that fixture list between now and the end of the year is the, is the big thing? I think I'm looking at kind of we need to go to Tanadice. Can always be tricky. I think I mean you've got the Europa games, but I think they kinda take care of themselves under Gerard, the kind of Europe the European games have always been I think we've got a free hit there at the moment. How well we've performed in the opening fixtures in the Europa League in the group. If we take anything Thursday night, I think we can well, look at ourselves. We'll and win go, the game on we're through. So that exactly. Takes a wee bit that of takes care of that, yeah. definitely. Yeah. But it's just getting to the end of the year and still in the position we're in, hopefully, because we've got some some tricky away games. We go to Ross County, I'm sure we go to Dundee United. And then obviously just after like, Hug Me and stuff, we've got Celtic at Ibrook. So they all kind of stand, all the league games stand out for me. Every league game that comes up now, I'm like a nervy eyes, even before the Aberdeen game. Yeah. I'm so nervous yeah. because I just know... I feel it's a different animal this season, Rangers. We've got ourselves in a good position. So I just look at it as every league game for me is massive and Europe will take care of itself. I'm, obviously, I still want to see the team do well, but the league for me, every league game for me is vital. The, the, one, the one thing that they've been great at so far this season, especially in the league, is the attitude. The attitude's yeah, a lot yeah. better. They're getting at teams early on. So yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it would take to half time, and then you know, or nothing each, or a goal down, and the managers had to yeah. roast the players at half time. And we've come out and started to play and win the game. But now yeah. I think from yeah. the first minute they're all at it, and it's yeah. that attitude. Yeah. If our yeah. attitudes like that in every game, then we'll go a long way. You're right. The Dundee United so, yeah. say, "No, they're just up, and they're, they're, it doesn't matter. They will be no. given a hundred, if it's possible, a hundred and fifty percent against us. Yeah. Because yeah, as I say, they all want to beat us." But if our attitude's right, and we've got the better individually against them, then we'll win the games. But you're right, I used to be like, I used to worry, well, we Aberdeen, we've got a poor record, Livingston, Kilmarnock, we can't get a victory. I'm terrible, I'm terrible. I'm the same. (laughs) See now, with the players that we have, and the attitude that they've got, it's going away from me that wee bit. Hopefully it doesn't go away from the players. If they can keep that going, then I'll be absolutely delighted. I won't, I won't be having breakdowns or anything. I am, I am testament to, uh, to what the hair dye can do. Um, it's all, <laughs> this, is, uh, this, is, this is all Grecian uh, or whatever it is. <laughs> Just putting a wee twist on that then for you, DJ, because you've played in Rangers teams that were apex predators winning everything and then maybe played in Rangers teams that weren't uh, always you know, winning, winning things as well. Um, and happy to point out you're on the former side of that ledger, uh, judging by the, the, the silverware that uh, you've got in the bag. But you're going along, you're in a good, you're in a good place, you're winning games, you're grabbing teams by the, the scuff of the neck right at the start, you're, you're front-facing it and stuff like that. A blip will inevitably come, and Rangers have you know, previously had that as well in other seasons, and we're going into this fixture of congestion as well. I'm just wondering, what's it like in the dressing room when you're in a really good run, and then you do get a wee blip. Is it a case of, no, that's fine, we can roll the top of this? Or does it take a little bit of pushing and pulling by senior members of the squad to get people back on track? I think, I think it's down to the manager. You know, if you're playing as well and all of a sudden you had a game where maybe only two or three players are playing the way they can and the others are not, and you don't get a result, this is where the manager and his backroom staff come in. You know, you, you don't say anything after the game because everybody's hyped up and you might say something, but you shouldn't. So you always leave it until the Monday morning when everybody's in and you sit them down. Big Jock used to do this to us, you know, quite regularly. And he would sit us down and say, right, what do you think went wrong at the weekend? And he would get the players themselves to come out. He says, don't hide anything. If you think somebody wasn't doing their job, come out and tell us. Because he'll have his say in a minute when you're finished. 
Yeah. And, and, and some things that cleared the air. Maybe it was just a bad game, because you'll get that. Now and again, players will have an off day. But the important thing is when you have an off day, is you still win the game. That's a sign of a team that's going to win a league. Yeah. I mean, you look at the, you look at the, the other mob in the East End, you know, in the last few games, scoring in the last minute to equalise or to win. Because they, they are winners. They've done that for the last nine years. They've been winning things. They're used to it. Our lads are not. There's very few in our team that have won anything, leagues mm-hmm. or cups or anything. So this is a new thing for them. So we've, mm-hmm. we've got to learn very, very quickly. But the, the, the players will know themselves. As I said earlier, if you're a player in there and you're doing well and all of a sudden you have a, a terrible game and you've been giving the ball away and everything else, you'll find yourself maybe on the bench the next game. Yep. And that's, yep. that's, I mean, look at Aji. Mm. Look at Morelis when he came off. He doesn't want to come off. I need to score goals. Oh, I'm staying. But I like that. Yeah. See if he came off yeah. and he was smiling, he was walking about. I said, no, that's not for me. Mm-hmm. And I think McCoy's mentioned that as well. Yeah, he was that, raging that, when he got taken that. Everybody's not happy. And he's seen that, his face. When the manager went to shake, he just walked by him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I like that. Because he doesn't want to get taken off. Well, if you don't want to get taken off any player, do the business. You've also been simple as that. You plus, think plus, interest, the fact, yeah. plus the fact, plus the fact, he was probably going to put on five players anyway when they went three nothing up. Just exactly. to rest a yeah. few for yeah. Thursday and everything else. But man else is no thinking that. No. I haven't scored enough goals this season. Why you take me off? I want to play on him. He wants to play every minute of every game and he wants to score. But you yeah, absolutely. Well, DJ, you piqued my interest. What's the uh, what's the dressing room after match? conversation slash bus stop that sticks in your mind from uh, from your playing days? Well, there's a few. <laughs> I, was prob- I, I was probably in the worst one with the manager. We, we were playing Celtic at Ibrooks, and uh, he said to me on the Friday, he says, I'm not playing you up front tomorrow, I'm playing you at the back, because they've got a big centre forward that's good in the air, really good. boy called Johannes said Valson, the big Icelander. You, you may be too young to, to remember him, but he was about 6'3". Big strong boy, you know, good in the air. So when the Saturday comes along, we're out there and Big Jock says to me, you know, remember, hey, get close to him in the box because if he gets a run on you, he's a big lad, he's going to win 99 headers out of 100. I said, I'll be there, boss, I know my job. So we'll go out. So after 45 minutes, we're coming up the tunnel, we're 2 nothing down. And Johannes said, Valson scored twice. <laughs> two headers. So I come in the dressing room and I'm looking and Big Jock just stared at me. He never looked at anybody else. And he walked straight over to me and went, centre half, you will never, ever be a centre half. <laughs> give you one job to do and you can't even do it. And I said, but Gaffer, he, he was good. He got right. I don't care. If he beats you in the air, you, you, you lean into him, you put him off. You don't give him a free header. You did it twice and he scored. He says, you get your backside up front. And he made a change. I think Colin Jackson was on the bench. He brought Colin on to centre half. And I get pushed up front with big Derek Parlane. Yeah. So we went up. So 10 minutes gone and I scored 2-1. And I'm sure it was big Derek that scored after that two each. And Cutty Young, the wee boy from Ayrshire, cut in for the left and had a screamer right in the corner. We won the game 3-2. <laughs> so I'm coming in after the game and I'm still raging at Big Jock giving me a right bollocking. You know, it's the first time I'd ever had a real bollocking in front of all the players. So I, I walked in and he was in, the, he was in the same bit again and he looked at me. I went, oh, Christ, I'm going to get this again. And he came over. That walk that he had. And Big Jock was 6'2". Wide, never mind high. He's come right over to me. He's grabbed me by the shoulders and he gave me a kiss in the forehead. He says, well done. What a second half. <laughs> I, said, I, was, I, don't, I don't know if that was worse than getting the ball in at half time. Getting a kiss with Big Jock. But, but that's <laughs> that, who he was. That's man management, though, isn't it? That's amazing see man management. Monday, see the Monday morning? You got everybody well done last. Wasn't he happy at half time? But you came out and you, you gave it to them a 1-3-2. Right. And it was forgotten. Never mentioned it again. And you're right. right that's good man management. Nah, and that was a lesson right. for me as well. Is that a funny. lesson for me hosting this podcast to try and manage you two uh, as well. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I subbed Willing off. Um, but so again, I'm, I'm really interested. And Stephen, feel free to jump in if you've got any questions for, for DJ from his playing time as well. Yeah. Um, because everybody speaks about the, uh, the blasting onto the scene with the cup final goal as well, uh, DJ. I've heard you speak about it before. What I've always wanted to ask is, 
you wheel away from school now at such a young age. Is it hard to put your feet or keep your feet on the ground after that when everything from your club, from the club you support, doing it in a cup final has just happened to you? How did, how did you feel? How did Derek Johnson feel after that match? Well, for a start, I wasn't a Rangers fan. I certainly did become, once, once I joined, I became a Rangers fan. All my family were all Dundee United, you know, the local team. No, and in fact, did no everybody's and, and, and fact, In fact, we used to go to Tanadice when they were at home, and when United were away, we went to see Dundee play. So we wanted both teams to win. That's different now, we fans. Dundee mm-hmm. fans hate United and vice versa. But that's what we did. I just wanted to see football. And I went every other week, got a sneaky in to, to the games and, and all that. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll mention names to you. You know, John Gregg, Alec McDonald, Sandy Jardin, Peter McCloy. They wouldn't allow you to be anything else but keep your feet on the ground. Because mm-hmm. they were at me all the time. And not, not that I had to, because believe it or not, I was a big shy boy when I came through there. I'd never been out of Dundee in my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd never, I'd never been anywhere. And Glasgow was the first big city that I'd ever been to. So I was mm-hmm. just a shy boy. And, you know, I got there. But the problem is you need to learn to look after yourself in a dressing room, especially when you're a footballer. Yeah. I hear it nowadays when young lads say, well, I was bullied by the manager. I was bullied by players. No, you're not bullied. What you're doing is it's, 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 it's all about fun in the dressing room. And if you can't answer back, then you're going to get drilled all the time. Mm. And I learned very, very quickly you know, to look after myself. There was a time, my first job as a 15-year-old was I used to collect all the training gear on a Friday. You know, we used to wear the same gear Monday to Friday. The same gear. The same, Nowadays, yeah. they've got two changes a day. Yeah. So we used to have the same gear. After they trained on a Monday, they had a big, huge uh, boiler room. It was ro- absolutely roasting. And we used to get the little mannequins and put our gear on it and put it in there so it was dry for the morning. But on a Friday... <laughs> All the, all the gear used to get washed on a Friday for the Monday. And my job was going around with a, with a wheelbarrow, put it in the middle of the dressing room, and the lads used to take their gear off and put it in, and I used to take it along to the washerwoman. <laughs> so everybody would do that except one person, Greggy. Greggy <laughs> would just take his gear off and throw it at his feet. So it happened two or three weeks in the trot, and Steenie came up to me and went, hey, what are you doing? I says, what are you talking about? He says, we're all coming over with our gear and putting it in, and he's throwing it down, and you're, you're having to go over and pick up. Tell him to get it in the, in the wheelbarrow. Don't throw it at his, down at his feet. I, I, I said, well, 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 I'll see what happens next week. You know, I'm, you know, how can I go and talk to the captain of Rangers in Scotland? <laughs> so the following week, I was dreading it. Honestly, the sweat was coming down the face. I think, oh, John, please throw that in the wheelbarrow. So I'm in there. So everybody's throwing it, and I look up, and I see Steenie and, and Wee Bud and Wally Henderson all looking at me. And Goes, Greggy just throws his stuff at his feet. <laughs> and then he went, I went, oh, jeez. So I've been hearing all the patter that's going on in the dressing room and all the nicknames and everything else. So I turns around and I walks over. John had the first peg as you go in the door. I, but he had the very first peg. I says, oh, jug ears. <laughs> Worst mistake I ever made in my life. <laughs> jug ears. I says, can you not put your gear in, in the bar like everybody else? He says, come here. And he was standing up on the, on the wee bench. It's there, got the bench all the way around. We stood on it. He says, turn around. And I turned around. And honestly, I don't know if you've had anybody size tens up your backside. <laughs> he booted me up the back. So I almost landed in the bar of myself. <laughs> don't you ever talk to me like that again. And honestly, and I looked up and Steenie, they were all on the ground all laughing. laughing. <laughs> but that, but that, that's not being bullied. No. You've, got to, you've got to go with that. And it doesn't matter if you're a professional club or you're an amateur club. You're always going to get people that want to make fun. And if you can't look after yourself, then you'll get ground down. And I think that's what happens with a lot of kids. They think that people are picking on them. No. They're trying to get a reaction. You need to grow up very, very quickly when you're in a dressing room. No matter if it's football, rugby or whatever. You have to get used to that. And that was my lesson. I certainly learned it. That's for sure. It's a pretty, a pretty good lesson. And t- talk about people who, who could do with a, a size. Holy boy! Like, He's well, back! back. <laughs> um, I'm bringing on, I'm making use of the new rules, guys, and I'm bringing on a 95th minute sub. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> run some doggies for me and back out the door. Um, 
But again, I was, uh, William, I'll include you here. I was saying um, to, to Stephen as well, if you've got any last questions for, for DJ, anything that you've, you've wanted to ask him from his playing days, please feel free before I move on to the next last segment, which is just a wee look ahead to Benfica. Mm -hmm. I'm going to save my questions, man, try and get DJ on my podcast as well, right? So I'll just save my questions and all right. <laughs> that was a nice wee, a nice wee plug there, and it looks like you're breaking up, Stephen. It sounds like you're breaking up. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, well, listen, can't can't argue with that. And obviously, I say to end of the listeners, make sure you tune into Stephen's podcast. I, th I think I think the, the, the question, and I'm I'm always asked two questions. I'm always asked to do that: is who's the best player you've ever played with, and without a shadow of a doubt, and, and with the greatest respect to to John Greg and Sandy Jardin and people like that. Davy Cooper is the best player wow. I've played with, the most talented footballer. He wasn't tall, never had a right foot, terrible in the air, wasn't quick, but what a left foot. You can say the same about Baxter, you know, yeah. but what a player. When you had that ball at his feet, when you were struggling and you needed a, bra a, a breather, you gave the ball to Davy and he went for a walk wait for 10 minutes beating people and everything else. And any anything he got the ball on the left, he didn't even have to look out for me. He just put it in the box. He did it on one right. side, and me, Tommy McLean, on the other. And he was just a fantastic. He's a great lad as well. well a wonderful right. person, Davy Cooper. Great player, and you know, still missed it. I still remember going to see him in the hospital the day before they pulled the plug on him. You know, uh, McCoy and I. I mean, it's just a sad, sad affair. Wonderful lad. He was the best player I certainly ever played with, in the greatest game. Uh, that I ever played in. Uh, I mean, people would think it would be the European Cup Winners Cup final, which was great, don't get me wrong. It was fantastic. But that semi-final against Bayern Munich at Ibrox when we beat them 2-0. Mm -hmm. And remember, they'd half the German national side in that Bayern team who won the European Championships that, that year, that summer. And then two years later, won the World Cup. You know, your Beckenbauers, your Sepp Meyers, your Gerd Müllers, you know, mm -hmm. Schwarzenbeck. You know, they had all them... We scored early through Sandy and, and Big Parlane scored after 22 nothing. Honestly, there was 80,000 at Ibrox that day. They were floating. The fans were floating. Right. Normally, normally at the end of the game or 10 minutes, 15 minutes to go, you see all the fans leaving to get their trains, their buses, the cars or whatever. Nobody left the stadium because this was such a momentous game. It's a game that we were going to win and it was going to take us to another European final. And I think it's the best night I've ever had as a Rangers player without a shadow of a doubt. That's goosebumps, man. I've got goosebumps hearing that. Well, I still get that talking about it, Stephen. Aye, I still get that talking about it. It's incredible and I agree, you get goosebumps hearing about it and since since Stephen uh, and William are being shot shy here, then, uh, then I'll follow well, I've, I've got a couple, I've got a couple. Right, okay, well bear with I me. I just was going to ask how, how much have I missed? <laughs> uh, you've missed it. You can tune in like the rest of the listeners as well, William. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Actually, DJ, just on that particular game, because I, I, I agree, I think that was a, a, a stunning performance against a bona fide, incredible Bayern team. Was the, the feeling in the dressing room before it, we can take this mob? Or was it a, let's feel our way into the game? How did you go out there? Because I always get the feeling that, again, you look yeah. like you're taking the team front foot by the scruff of the neck, much like the current team's doing. Mm. Well, you should always feel confident in yourself. There's no point in saying, well... We're going to struggle here tonight, or, or thoughts like that. Because if you're thinking that way, then you're not going to win games. You've got to think positive. And remember, two weeks previous, we'd gone to Germany. We drew one each with them. And when, how we got a one each, I'll never know. We were absolutely battered. There was a stat that came out a day after that game. It said, for the first time ever in a European game, 10 outfield players of Bayern Munich all had a shot at our goal. <laughs> All 10 outfield players had a shot at our goal. That's how much on top they were. So we, we've, we've come back, you know, in, in the plane after the game thinking, God, how the hell did we get a one each there? <laughs> you know, but say, but if we can do that away mm -hmm. on their patch, you know, right. so we were feeling a wee bit we more confident on, on our own, especially getting an early goal settled us right down. Yeah. The Rangers fans... I mean, they were in an hour before the game singing, they were all excited and, and they made so much noise. I mean, I don't know if that put off the Germans or not because, you know, crowds in Germany are probably bigger than they are in Scotland. So mm -hmm. maybe that wasn't the case, but our fans were fantastic and it spurred us on, that's for sure. It was the first time that Parlane and I played in midfield. 
Because oh, the punters yeah. must have been looking, looking at that team and going, two strikers playing midfield. Because remember, up front we had Colin Steen and Willie Johnson. Yeah. That's well, a very we were asked to do a marking job on, on the likes of Franz Roth. I had to pick up Franz Roth. And, uh, and and what, who was the other one? The man that was in midfield is now the, the chairman of Bayern Munich. Um, oh. Starts with an H. Oh. Anyway, I'll see you in about three weeks' time. I'll phone you and tell you what it was. <laughs> we had to do man marking jobs because they were the two playmakers. Mm-hmm. So, and, and it worked. You know, Wally Johnson and Colin Steen, for me, were the heroes of, of that European campaign. The two of them are absolutely sensational. Karl Heinz Rummenigge? No. But he played, that wasn't he? He was a, he was a forward. Oh, yeah, I thought he oh, was. His name. But he is the chairman, though, of, of Bayern, is he not? He's the chairman of Bayern. No, it's not Rummenigge. He's one of the directors. Oh. Oh. I'm really proud of that. I'm really for not knowing that. I'll tell you right off that. <laughs> <laughs> that is going to bother me. We're just going to edit that whole bit out. I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uli Honus. Uli Honus. There we go, DJ. Yeah, that's. I remember I had, to, I had to mark him in Germany, and Uli Waddle, who was the manager then, said to me, I want you to go with him everywhere. He says, If he goes to the toilet, you go with him. He says, I want you that close to him. And uh, after the game, we came in, one each in the gaffer. The gaffer went brilliant, great result. He says, you, he pointed to me, he says, we're the man of the match. I says, Gaffer, I had three touches of the ball. He says, but Honus only got three touches as well. And he was their playmaker. You stopped him playing. I says, there's another 10 players there. He said, does it matter? I asked you to do a job. And you did it. Well, that was an Uli Honus. William? Uh, Just a a shot. (laughs) uh, Just uh, doing a wee bit of research on that. and You scored after 22 seconds. Tannadice. Tana, or, or, or Hamden. I'm not too sure where it was, to be honest. Well, it was, it was Dundee United. Dundee the United. Dundee United. We had to beat Dundee United at Tannadice to win the league. Yeah. yeah. We took the centre and it came in and it turned the centre half and stuck it in the bottom left hand corner. The great thing about that, if you ever watch it, all my brothers were up in the stand. I've got six brothers. Yeah. I couldn't understand why my mother said she had seven sons, but I've only got six brothers. <laughs> they said, they don't know me that. But, they were, but they were all in the stand that day, you know, and it was a first place salute. And of course, that was the only goal, and it won us the league. And then three weeks later, it was a cup final against Hearts. Uh, yeah. That's a great story again. Uh, we're, coming up, we're coming out of the tunnel at Hamden, both teams, and Tommy McLean's at my back. And we Tam pulls the shirt and says, Listen, first free kick we get. He says, Get yourself to the back post. He says, Turn your back on me. Then just turn. He says, And make a run for the near post. I said, right, Tam. So in the first minute, we get a free kick. I was fouled. It must have been about 40 yards out on the right-hand side. I'm sure it was Jim Jeffries who was their, became their manager. He was the centre-half that day. It was either him or Big Andy Anderson fouled me. So the free kick was there. So we, Tam, looked at me. He never said anything. And I went up the park to the back post. And it was only later on, when I watched it on the telly, that Greggy came up. He, he took all the free kicks. And he said to Tam, away, you go, me, Tam, went like that to him. He's arm, no. Stay out the road. And Greggy walked away. And we Tam only took two steps. Magnificent pass of a ball. And he's looking and looking and looking. And as soon as I turned and made a move, he just pinged his ball to the near post. And I've got up and put the header right in the back of the net. First minute. And, and it was fantastic. <laughs> and, and after the game, I always remember Archie McPherson interviewed me. He said, listen, what a start the Rangers had. He says, what a fantastic goal. He says, you must have been working on that all week. And I was about to say, no, we Tam just told me. I said, yes, we have. <laughs> but, but we were working on it. I never really scored, but uh, it worked, which was fantastic. But that was we Tam and his football brain. Just, we'll only get away with it once. Brilliant. And we did. That's and, all we did. And we scored. And that, was, that gets off to a great start. DJ, do you remember? That's... Oh, you go, mate. Sorry, do you remember? Um, you scored before the actual official... Kick-off time as well. Yeah. The game, the game kicked up. It's the quickest that's goal ever it. scored the cup final. A minute oh, before three. Yeah. Always will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll never be beaten, I don't think. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. If I, uh, if I uh, jump on then, guys, just to, just before we close up and, and close the doors on the, on this episode, uh, looking forward to Benfica. So I'll just quickly go through, guys. Just uh, and uh, I'll start with uh, I'll start with you, Stephen. I'll go William, then I'll go Derek, uh, and we'll see about a projected score. 
Stephen, give us your uh, Rangers v Benfica prediction. Mm, I think we'll one each. One each. Interesting. Mm. William? I miss my few players, aren't I? Uh, two one Rangers. Two one Rangers. DJ? Remember, when we, we played them the last time, you know, until the boy gets sent off, they were a very, very good side when they had 11 men. We came into it, obviously, when they went down to 10 men and played some great stuff. Should have won the game. Mm-hmm. But they came back again, you know, with two late goals, with 10 men. I don't care if they're two or three missing. They were a good squad of players as well. But again, as I said earlier to you, if Rangers are in the mood, and they will be in the mood on Thursday, I think I think we'll have every chance of beating them. And I'll go along with the two of us said 2-1. I think we'll win the game 2-1. Okay, well, I'm going to... And qualify. I'll, I'll stick my colours to the mast then that I actually think, for all those reasons you've just mentioned there, DJ, that it might just be another draw. Um, I, I'll happily take the point because they're a very, very good side. So Absolutely. It, so would, yeah. it leaves it for me to say, um, this has been This Is Ibrooks, and you can get us on our YouTube, Twitter, Acast, iTunes sites, do all that good stuff that more technically advanced people than me can get a handle on. Um, I'd be... Yeah, I'm very analogue. It's as simple as that. But it does leave me to say to our part-timer, uh, William, for coming back on right at the death. Hello, oh, no, boy. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. To, uh, to Stephen as well, thank you so much for joining us. And also Pleasure. to the one and only Derek Johnson, thank you so much for joining us as well. Guys, I've really enjoyed that. You're very good welcome. Well done, lads. It was a good night. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Brilliant. This is the place of dreams. The rangers we love may feel afar, but on Christmas night, the door is ajar. We've always been ready for the challenges we face, but are they ready for this wish to be the best? In the footsteps of legends, these kids walk tall, for this is Rangers, the greatest of all. For our lassies with their blue scarfs on. For our lads who want to hear Ibrooks roar. But most of all, and best of all, we want to see the Rangers score. On you go. And all we want for Christmas is to have you back in here with us. But until then, we wish Rangers fans across the world a very Merry Christmas and a successful 2021.